All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our fourth webinar uh, to talk about COVID-19 and to offer some educational opportunities for some of our EMTs across the state. Um, looks like we have some folks from down in District 2 on as well as District 7, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share a screen. Just give me one second here. Can I get somebody to jump in and say, see if they can see the, the PowerPoint? I can see the PowerPoint, Kyle. All righty, thanks a lot, appreciate that. So we're a little thin on speakers this evening. Um, Keith Risky had a, a family obligation, so he's not here. So I'm gonna kind of run through some of the updates that, that he would normally run through. So first off, what we've talked about at each one of the, the meetings is uh, tonight, there's one and a half hours available for continuing education. So if you have not uh, logged into your EMS portal, go ahead and do that and register for the class. That's going to be open until about 1030 tonight. If you don't know how to, how to do that, go ahead and send me a text message with your name as it appears on your EMT card. And the number for that text message is 605. 216-6794. So go ahead and send that to me um, if you need me to enter you in for the hours and we will get, get that taken care of after the webinar. So the only guest speaker I believe we have tonight, unless there's a couple other ones that jumped on, I know we've reached out to some people, but um, some had, had uh, obligations. We have Amy Marshall. Actually, Kyle. Yep. Sorry to let you know, but just to let you know, I am calling in from New York, so I am available. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get you on as well, Chad. So, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. So we have Amy Marsh, the EMS educator for Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, um, and she's also the District Two Vice President. She's going to talk to us this evening a little bit about what's happening down in Sioux Falls and what they're doing to keep themselves safe. And then we do have Chad Madsen, who is our District Two Vice President who is actually working out in New York City, um, helping, helping the, the crew out out there. So we're gonna get to him um, to speak to us as well. He is on duty, so he may have to jump out of this. So I think I'm probably gonna go to you first, Chad, when I get through this, so just hang tight. I just got a couple of, couple of slides to run through. So kind of by the numbers, just got this off the DOH website. Uh, 13 active cases are reported by the De South Dakota Department of Health in um, District 4, 850 active cases are reported across South Dakota. That's as of today. Um, there's 124 of those that have ever been hospitalized, meaning that have ever went to the hospital due to um, COVID-19. That's not the number that's currently in the hospital, but that is the number that um, is, has been in the hospital. Um, 10 deaths have been reported. There was another one that was reported today in Gerald County. Um, so that number is up to 10. Uh, some of the age breakdown, you can kind of see here. Um, the majority of the cases lie between the 20 to 59 year olds, which has kind of been the trend in South Dakota since this got going. But the death rates are between 50 and 80 plus. So when you see these really large death rates from uh, New York area, um, some of the different states that have, that have had large death rates, their death rates and their cases in that 70 to 80 plus area, or even the 50 to 80 plus area, are quite a bit higher than ours are. They are still more on the smaller end of, of, the, of the total groups 
but there's more people of those ages that are getting infected in some of those states. And that is some of the reason why we have those higher death rates in those states is due to the fact of the, the extenuating uh, or health conditions, um, the respiratory the diseases that, that that age group sometimes faces. So that's where you're seeing those larger death rates in some of those areas. So if you look at our age group, I mean, if we can keep that 70 to 80 plus area on the low end, um, it, it definitely might keep our death rate down, which is definitely what we want. So just some reminders about what we're, you know, what we're trying to drive home here is just make sure that you have an accurate count of your PPE. Make sure that you have enough to respond to potential COVID-19 calls as they come in. Make sure that you're checking your PPE on a regular basis. I had a service tell me the other day that they had some PPE walk out the door. So make sure that you have it in, a, in an area where it can be secured so you don't have that happening. Uh, if there is a need for PPE, there are some vendors that have been able to supply uh, recently some small orders. Um, otherwise, go ahead and contact the State Department of Health. Make sure you're running that through your service director and even um, maybe your emergency manager in your county as well. You're still probably going to be the one that goes through the Department of Health, but just make sure everybody in your county, in your area is on the same page. Um, we're talking about plans. Just be aware of the plans that, are, that, that your service has put into place. Um, practice those plans. Make sure all parties that could potentially be showing up on the scene of a potential COVID patient know what's going on. That's ambulance service. That's fire guys who might be helping. That's police. And that's your sheriff's department as well. And possibly even reach out to your higher patrol folks. If you have higher patrols that respond to ambulance calls in your community, make sure they're on the same page of what you're doing in your community so uh, they can do the same thing. Uh, mental health, last week we had a mental health provider on and it was, it was received very well. Um, so obviously we, we wanna think about ourselves in, in this time of, of the world that we're living in. Um, so the providers, mental health is, is key, the families, our families could potentially be affected by this. Um, they could be extremely worried about you potentially going, going on a call and becoming exposed and then having to quarantine uh, as well. Uh, the patients that we're going on, not even talking COVID patients here, just the patients that have been cooped up in their house for, for a month or not able to see their loved ones for, for the better part of a month here now. There are resources available uh, Northeastern Mental Health was the, the group that was talking last week, and Amy did a great job doing that. We really appreciated her coming on. Uh, contact their office, contact your local um, mental health professionals, and get those resources out there so folks that are struggling have an avenue. You know, there's other information and resources available. Um, one thing that I'm going to touch on a little bit tonight because I did watch the national news and there was a comment made yesterday by our president in regards to injecting bleach, Lysol, things like that into humans to potentially help combat the virus. Um, if any of you follow this, you realize that by about seven o'clock this morning, those companies were issuing statements that that is not a safe practice. I did hear tonight that there's been hundreds of calls to, to the different COVID, COVID hotlines asking how to do this and if this is actually something that can be done to help, to help people who have it or potentially help people from, from getting it. So that is one more thing to now be aware of that is out there that people are talking about and chances are somebody's probably gonna try it. So just be aware. Uh, that that potentially could, could be a call that you could be going on is that somebody decided to do that. So um, it was quickly walked back today on the comment that was made um, by health professionals, by the companies who um, make Lysol wipes and Lysol spray and so on. So um, 
the unfortunate thing is people heard it and there's probably going to be people that try it. So be aware of that potential. Uh, COVID.SD.gov, great website. Uh, they just redid it this week. So it's, it's a little more cumbersome, but there's a lot more information on it. So that's a great website to get your info from. CDC.gov as well, the Department of Health.SD.gov, the Rural Health EMS website has some very good stuff on there. Um, there's a weekly EMS call Mondays at 10 a.m. that's put on by the South Dakota EMS office. Marty Link and his crew put that on. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, ask your service director about that call. They have the information and the Zoom link to get on that. Or you can go on to the website, the uh, Providers Rural Health slash EMS website, and they do post those calls on there. So some very good information in those calls. There's also a daily Department of Health press, press conference at 1145 every day where the Secretary of Health and the state epidemiologist talk about the cases that they put up on the website, talk about the number, and they answer press questions. There's also the daily governor's press conference at 245 on Mondays through Thursday, and then sometimes move to the morning um, on Fridays. So that is kind of it with my presentation. I think, um, I think Chad's gonna kind of just tell us a little bit about what he's been experiencing out in New York responding to 911 calls. Um, so Chad, if you wanna talk for a few minutes regarding kind of what you're seeing, we'd, we'd really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, Kyle. So uh, actually, I we took off from Minnesota and uh, we got here on March 31st and we've been here ever since. Uh, I'll tell you what, it's been a great experience for us. The thing we've done out here is we've seen a lot of this COVID-19. I mean, pretty much when we first got here the first week, that's pretty much all the calls we were running was just sick fever coughs, sick fever coughs and uh, that. So they've been really good to us. They've had all the PPE available and, uh, and that for us and AMR is doing a great job. But uh, the, the things that we've kind of noticed out here on some of the stuff and, and this disease is unlike anything I've ever seen. I mean, we're picking up patients that uh, you'll get the pulse oximeter and you'll be like, oh my God, what the heck is wrong with my pulse oximeter? Because we've had pulse oximeter readings of 30% with, uh, they're, they're breathing rapidly, <laughs> Uh, pulse oximeter says 30% and these guys aren't cyanotic and they're actually sitting there talking to us and uh, you know it, they say it's something to do with the, the, the thing I got they said something about the blood and the iron and the hemoglobin it, it, it's not, not letting the oxygen in these guys are the ones that uh, right afterwards I mean we're, we're seeing them and these are the guys that end up on the ventilator like 24 hours later and it, it's just incredible when you see these guys. And you're just like, how in the heck can these guys be up and uh, moving around? Like I said, we've done quite a bit out here in New York. Uh, like I said, we are running the 911, and we're currently in the Brooklyn area, so we actually have one of the roughest neighborhoods down here. But uh, it, it, it's really been something. Uh, the other thing we've seen a lot of is, uh, well, the reason we're down here is, New York City went from like 2,500 calls to running 8,000 calls a day. So EMS just couldn't keep up. So they brought us out here and uh, that's what we've been doing. Other thing I've kind of noticed is the cardiac arrests here. Uh, some of these people are- Unknown origin. Yeah, it's just unknown origin. I, these guys are just dying for no reason out here. Uh, all of a sudden you'll sit there and you can go to a patient who says something and 30 minutes later, you're getting called back to the same address for cardiac arrest, and they were absolutely fine when when we left there. So it's it's not something that's a joke. I mean, it, it really is. It, and it, and yeah, and it, it's not age discriminatory. I've got my partner here, uh, Zach, and he he's kind of adding stuff into it here, and he can kind of explain a little bit. I mean, what would you say about this whole thing, Zach? So we're seeing a lot of middle age, 30s, 40s some in their 50s that they're running marathons they're doing other things and then this comes along and they're fine 
today they're fine tomorrow and all of a sudden they can't breathe 24 hours later they're intubated and they're um and they're seeing a bunch of mucus sputum that they can't it's unknown origin what they're telling us is um that the COVID-19, the virus is attacking the uh, the cells in the lungs that do the oxygenation. So the alveoli are opening, everything's functioning right, but the body can't do the oxygen exchange, and so it's backing up with fluid. They can't. They right now they can't explain why we're seeing a tar-like fluid, but. Yeah, almost um, like a necrosis type thing when we actually get these patients intubated. Yeah, and they're and once that sets in, right now there is no there's no recovery from that. If they can, they've had some luck with medications and uh, lessening the fluid, but once they get the full symptomatic and they're on a vent, we're not seeing the return. Um, back to normal. Uh, the people that are recovering, they're showing signs of 30, per, 30 to 40 percent lung volume loss. Um, their their lungs just aren't capable of oxygenation anymore. The other thing we're seeing too is you have a patient, one of the symptoms that we're seeing early is uh, blood sugar spikes. So they're not diabetic. They're not feeling well. You do blood sugar and they're three, four hundreds. No history of diabetes, no nothing. They aren't eating or they haven't eaten uh, that day. Um, but we're seeing unknown blood sugar spikes. Yeah, it actually is like an exacerbation for DKA. Yeah, um, we're seeing yeah, anything 300 and higher, it's just, we're seeing symptoms that you just wouldn't expect from the normal. The, yeah. the days past, they're seeing like after, so he's symptomatic today. In the future, he's going to be headaches that he can't control with pain meds. No taste. Um, they're losing their taste, the ability to smell that may may or may not return some that are that are uh, getting through the virus they have no sense of smell or taste that will return and some that do um it's very it's, the sad part is a lot of the symptoms are very person to person and they they don't understand why right at this point um we're seeing some that don't have any symptoms and tomorrow they're intubated and they can't control the mucus we're seeing some with full symptoms, but they're functioning like you and I are with with little at all um, difference in their normal life. So right. it's I mean, all over the place. Yeah, it can go from the most extreme thing to we've actually got guys that they're, they're just sitting there and they, they look absolutely healthy and they're COVID positive. But I mean, yeah, we're so seeing you, a lot of carriers. Yeah. They're, so they're COVID positive with no symptoms and they've been, and they were tested two, three weeks ago and they've never had a symptom. Yeah. And, and you know, they're coming back positive. So you really can't depend on the whole symptoms thing. I mean, you got it out here. It's, it's basically you treat everybody like they are a carrier because uh, it, it, you, you just don't know what you're getting into. They're, Our, they're, the NYC protocol right now is masks. Also, the masks I'm wearing, if you guys can see them, um, just the general mask is worn all the time, inside, outside. So surgical It doesn't matter masks. where you are, yep. And then N95s anytime you're with a patient. And uh, yeah, and they're, and basic full PPE on anything that's respiratory related. Yeah. Uh, obviously we got to worry about aerosols and things like that so if you're nebulizing patients you know it has to be done outside it has you to can't be do it in a truck yep. you can't do it in your house yep it's, it's, we want we have to do it outside they're the talking sorry they're talking your um so when you do an intubation if you if it goes airborne they're talking three to four plus hours that that stays in the area airborne 
So it's full PPE, full protocol. If you can, we're supposed to be using HEPA filtered everything, our suction, anything we can to try and pull everything we can away from us. No. And uh, like I said, NY, uh, FDNY has been absolutely great to us. Uh, New York Police Department, these guys are just amazing at what they're doing. AMR doing a great job of getting us the stuff that we need. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't sit there and uh, these guys are absolutely doing a great job of making sure we have everything that we need out here. But like I said, it's, it's just, we went from, according to uh, the New York Fire Department, I mean, we went from about 75 cardiac arrests a day to over 800. Yeah, so in the, beer, so in the boroughs, they were running 75 to 100 cardiac arrests a day. That's their average. Uh, for over a week straight, they did almost 900 a day um, to the point where uh, without AMR, they were literally out of PPE. Yeah. Um, without the response out here, they didn't have the masks, the gowns, the gloves. They, they were out running out. But now everybody's got everything. Yeah. So, so. It, it's really been something, like I said, it, it's kind of amazing. Like I said, we're actually, me and Zach are down in Brooklyn, but we've actually been in all five boroughs. We ran in, uh, first we were running in Queens. In the and then we, or the first night we got here, we actually got here at 8.30 at night from driving. They put us right on the streets. We were going till two o'clock in the morning, uh, running out of uh, Yankee Stadium. And I mean, we just hit the ground running and just started doing emergency calls. And it was just, like I said, one after another, it was just sick fever, cough, sick fever, cough. You'd get into the hospitals and the hospitals, you'd be standing in line for, it, it's not like this anymore, but the first week that we were here, you could literally be standing for two and a half hours. Or more. Or more. They there. didn't have the beds and the, and the hospital won't take the patient until you can transfer them off your cot. So you had a three, four, one of our crews had an eight hour wait in the ER because uh, they had priority cases above them. Yep. It, I mean, it, it, when we first got here, I mean, it, it, it was absolutely a war zone out here. It has really gotten a lot better in the last couple of weeks. So you know, uh, like I said, with the crews that they've had available, the hospitals are starting to get volunteers. I mean, it, it's really improved a lot from when we first got here. Yeah, someone was asking about the cardiacs being classified as COVID deaths. Almost all of them. I was going to say almost every single one of these. Because is... they're unknown. They're unknown origin and they aren't performing autopsies right now. Um, the coroner's office will pick them up. They'll do the transport, but they were running so many that the offices just can't keep up. So and, if uh, it was of unknown origin, it was labeled COVID. Yep. And, and like I said, I, there's no other reason that all these people were just, I, I really stress that, you know, you went, we went from 75 cardiac arrest to over 800. I mean, the only contributing factor in this is that COVID-19 is out here. So, you know, I, it, it, it's, it's just kind of a crazy little deal, but, uh, you know, like I said, it is getting better. All right. So we've got some, we've got some good questions popping in on the chat. Does anybody have any questions for Chad and Chad and Zach? I guess I, I'm going to say it on behalf of everybody. Um, we appreciate what you're doing for that crew out there. Obviously, EMS is a family across the country, yep. across the world. Um, we appreciate what you're doing for those folks out there. Well, and, and like I said, I mean, these guys have absolutely been great to us too. Uh, seven o'clock at night, the city actually comes out and they start cheering and, uh, and ringing bells and singing and everything. And that's an appreciation for all the healthcare workers that are out here. I mean, the city is absolutely, uh, Times Square, there's big banners down there that have pictures of all the healthcare workers and it, it reads thank you all the way down the thing the empire state building was lit up in red that kind of flashes and it's supposed to be the heartbeat of healthcare i mean this city is absolutely just doing so much right now and for the healthcare providers i mean all these first responders are absolutely doing an amazing job out here so 
That's great. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Chad and Zach? Yeah, I have a quick question. Okay. When you find these uh, people that are have their O2 back down to the 30s and 40s, does adding O2 on, improve that situation at all? It, okay, and you're talking on the, the ones that are in the SPO2s of 30s and 40s? If Not we, a lot. I was going to say, it, it, it can go either way. Sometimes when you do something for them, it does bring it up a little bit. But you're not going to get it. I mean, like we're seeing 50s and 60s with with 15 liters O2. Um, we're not seeing like it's not it's not a bump up to the 90s where they should be. Yeah, it it, it you'll never get it up to the O2 sets where they're supposed to be. It it does sometimes bring it up, but sometimes it it just doesn't do anything. You know, and uh, it, it, it just kind of depends. But like I said, these guys that are in that 30s and 40s, which I've never, well, I don't think anybody before this disease, I mean, just sit there and think that you've got patients that are, you know, pulse oximeters are reading 30 and 40, and uh, you're sitting there and you're, abs you're just like, is my pulse ox? The first time I saw it, I thought my pulse oximeter was broken. Well, the I, I, ER looked at you like you were. Yeah, down. and the, <laughs> the nurse had just got there too, and she looked at me when I sat there and said, "I got a pulse ox reading of 40," and she she thought I was insane. And then she did it, and she got the same thing. So, you know, it, it's kind of something that uh, really goes. The question was, uh, how long are we out here? We still don't know, uh, and, and we're not going to know probably until until it's time to go home. So. Uh, it, it, they're just kind of holding us, uh, and, and and like I said, they're going to keep us here till they they need us, and uh, we're we're just kind of we're pegged right now as an ALS essential unit, right? So we're going to be probably one of the last ones to go until until Fidney is up and running in their complete numbers. Um, but they're pulling crews, and they're telling them as they're literally leaving. So we uh, we have no idea, right? And. You know, now that they've actually got us pegged as ALS crews, we're actually responding to more of the other emergencies like your heart attacks, cardiac arrests, uh, you know, things like that. Because they're actually giving it. When we first got here, they didn't know the difference between BLS units and ALS units. Now they actually have a, a system of knowing this. So we're actually getting pegged for a lot more calls. And the BLS units are actually the ones that are going for these sick fever coughs now. More so, we're getting when, saved. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. When you were talking about the oxygen, and maybe you already said this, I, but I missed it and I apologize. Um, are you doing non rebreathers on them? Or are you doing forced air masks? Or what are you putting on them to try to get that up? What are they recommending now? So, out here right now, we're putting non rebreathers on everybody um, because we're trying to stay away from aero, like nebulized treatments and things like that, so things that are going to put other individuals at risk and obviously when i come back to south dakota i don't want to bring something that i don't have already with me we can so, do we can do forced air right now the problem that they're having is if you force it and it's too too fast or too hard that you're literally crapping them out the, the lung okay. the lungs the body's not keeping up they're not that's able what to i wondered because i had heard that they were doing more of the forced air instead of non-rebreather, but then I didn't know how you kind of monitored that, really. The ER will, but out here at right. the road, we, it, we're we knocking them out, and then we have, we're we going to have to result to BVM or something else until the ER gets, gets okay. them set up. Right. Okay, thanks, guys. Yep, no problem. Anybody got anything else? Chad, I guess I had one for you. Okay. Um, so if you guys are running, you know, just regular 911s, is, is there still the crime rate? in the city yes there is yeah, there, there yeah. actually is uh in fact one of the nights when we, we were down there they, they, like i said we're actually in kind of we're in we're in brooklyn so and we're actually in the thing if, if anybody wants to google something check out pink houses uh, it's one of the most dangerous crime or it's one of the most dangerous housing projects in the united states and we're actually that's one of our response areas we me and zach have been there like five times already yeah. Uh, 
it's one of those places we actually got to watch out for airmail because they'll we've they'll, had we've had guys as we're sitting on the block they're taking trucks they're breaking windows they're taking what they want and we actually right have now pd doesn't have doesn't have the manpower or the ability to yeah. take on everything and so you're literally it's literally hey if you caught them send it to pd and they'll do what they can but yeah, unfortunately, um, though you can imagine the P, the police department and the fire department, but they're down. Well, the police department's down worse than the fire department, but. Uh, so in general, right now, if uh, so, New York City is down as a total about still about twenty six percent for public safety, including fire, EMS, and law enforcement. Right, and uh, EMS as a whole is down about seventeen percent. Yeah, and there's actually, I mean, we've had quite a few, well, they just had uh, a funeral for a bunch of the EMS guys that unfortunately have succumbed to yeah. COVID-19 here. So, it, it, you know, it is dangerous. I mean, these guys are healthy, healthy EMS workers that were just trying to help out and, and now they're, they're gone because of this disease. So, I mean, you definitely have to take this thing seriously. All right. Anybody else have any questions for these two guys? Well, Chad, we really appreciate you guys out there. Stay safe. Get back to us in one piece. All right. And uh, go. go ahead. Sure. Uh, my question is, what are the subways like? Are they completely shut down the subways or are there? Nothing. Nothing the shut down. Yeah, they are still running, uh, but the town is literally a ghost town. Uh, it, 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 the traffic in the last week has started picking up, but when we first got here, I mean, there was just nobody. Uh, so you, your light rails and your subways, they still function every day like normal. However, they're empty. Yep. They're running two, three people one way. Yeah, bus. They're just, but they're, they're actually still functioning, moving, yes. The, the buses are, I mean, the buses are empty. The and only the, thing we haven't seen is the traditional yellow cab. Yeah, the, how New York City, you think of yellow cabs running around everywhere? They're, there's none. They're there's like not non-existent. But everything else, all your public safety, everything that's semi-free, uh, the city buses, all of that transportation is still running as if it never stopped, as if there was no issue. Yeah. But they're empty. They're, they're, yeah, they're completely. The public staying in like they're supposed to be. And they are. I mean, it, as it gets warmer, they, they do tend to come out a little bit more. Uh, today is probably one of the biggest traffic days we've seen so far. And I think that's because the governor sat there and said, he keeps telling everybody, oh, things are getting better. Things are getting better. And I think people are getting complacent and they're. They're starting they're to move around. They're getting tired of cooped up in their house. Yeah. Last so. time I was in New York City, they had those black SUVs traveling everywhere. I go, so they're, all, they're all gone too? They, yep. Oh, you're talking about the, like the Ubers? Yeah, those great big black SUVs that everybody rides privately? There actually is a few of them still running. We, you can see them moving yeah, around. Uh, Ubers have still been going. A lot of those guys, if you look inside them now, they've duct taped like plastic liners between the the front and the back so that they're trying to keep the back of the vehicle completely separated from the front of the vehicle but they are still running thank you all right thanks a lot guys we really appreciate it um, no problem i'm just glad we got through with it without getting a call <laughs> yeah yeah that's great thanks a lot stay safe and maybe we'll check in with you again next week Sounds good. You guys take care. Good. Thanks, Chad. Yep. Later. Bye. Thanks. All right. So next off, we're going to move on to um, Amy Marsh, who is the Sioux Falls Fire Rescue EMS um, educator, uh, as well as District 2's VP. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Amy to, to talk to us a little bit about what's going on in Sioux Falls and with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. Well, good evening. I hope everybody's doing well. Chad, thanks for uh, sharing that information. Um, a lot of what you were talking about is things that we've been preparing for here in Sioux Falls. Um, I got a little, I'm going to share a little funny story about 
um, self-isolation and, and uh, things like that. Um, when I'm not in the office, um, I'm working from home, uh, doing some prep work and things like that, um, just because we, our training center has a cadet academy going and so we're trying to keep the numbers uh, limited. So I'm working from home today and I live in the, on an acreage and I look out my window and I see flames. Uh, unknownst to me that the farmer that does, takes care of my uh, cropland was burning off some corn stalks. Um, I, of course, call 911. By the time I get out there, <laughs> he's like, what are you doing? So um, yeah, I, so I had a little excitement working from home today. Um, had my own fire at my own house. One of my division chiefs called me and asked me what I was doing calling, uh, calling fires in when I was at home. So, um, so a little bit about what's going on in Sioux Falls. Uh, Kyle asked me to share some information. Um, we've been preparing um, probably for a good six weeks down here in Sioux Falls. Um, as you guys well know, um, we ended up with um, a hot spot in the nation uh, just a few weeks ago. And um, we're dealing with that right now. And so I kind of wanted to talk to you about our response and how we have um, directed our providers in the city of Sioux Falls. I'm going to share um, a PowerPoint that we put to together um, that we've been um, of the education that we presented. So let me get that turned on here. And if somebody will make sure once I get this shared um, that I'm on the right, be great. Looks like we got you, Amy. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so what we have implemented here in Sioux Falls uh, is called Scout. And um, I, I guess the other thing I want to quick ask, are you guys seeing my screen with my notes or are you seeing just the full screen? We've got kind of that split screen where we're seeing the okay. next slide. How about now? There we got you. Perfect. Okay. I just have to, I don't know for sure. I have two screens up, but I never know which one's going to present. So um, I want to make sure I get to the right information. So we've implemented Scout. Um, Scout was a process that was implemented out in Seattle originally. Um, if you're interested, you can um, go to YouTube and type in Scout EMS, and you can um, actually watch the video that uh, Seattle made. So we are not um, reinventing the wheel here in Sioux Falls. Um, we're stealing as much information as we can from all of the people that are going before us. Um, a lot of what Chad was talking about as far as response is items that have been brought up. Uh, the low, low um, pulse oximetry, um, getting patients out, into the air if you need to do any nebulizers. All of those things are, are things that we're talking about. So let's kind of just start with Scout um, and, and go through that process with you. Um, so just to kind of tell you about our day, um, as soon as the first thing that we implemented was uh, the social distancing and our crews um, do not, interact any longer um, at shift change. Anything, any information that needs to be um, discussed is done by phone. Um, the outgoing crew cleans their area and, and puts away all of their own material. Um, they leave the building and the next crew waits and then comes in after they have left um, and then starts the day. We've implemented wearing cloth masks uh, or surgical masks. Um, all the time in the stations. Um, when we go on calls, we switch out the cloth mask uh, to N95s for um, response. Uh, and we're using N95s uh, for every patient EMS call. So um, if then you are dispatched, um, what has been implemented now for I want to say 
um, close to two months now, um, we have a surveillance tool that dispatch does. And what they will actually say is, uh, they'll ask the, the surveillance questions, you know, um, have you been around somebody? Do you have COVID? Um, and then that information is communicated to us if they are surveillance positive or negative. Um, we have had patients that refuse uh, to give us information because they are aware that we're doing surveillance and they feel like we won't respond if they're COVID positive which is very sad. Um, we just wanna make sure that our people are well, um, well suited with PPE to respond to these patients so that we, we have uh, limited exposure. So when the 911 call comes in, no matter um, if they're surveillance positive or negative, we've implemented what's called SCOUT. And what the SCOUT system does, um, it's whatever EMS unit arrives on scene. If you um, are aware in um, Sioux Falls, we have um, a tiered response where Sioux Falls Fire acts as a first responder agency, and then the ambulance service of patient care EMS actually is your ambulance um, ALS transport service. Um, based on the call, the location, um, either one of us can be the first on scene. So whichever unit arrives on scene first um, is gonna limit the number of responders um, to see the patient. And so we defined um, the warm and the hot zone. We really never wanna exceed, exceed four members in the hot zone. And um, we do, if especially if we're going into a business or residence, we do what's called a doorway assessment. Um, that doorway assessment, um, is this, we um, also ask the screening questions again. And then we ask the patient if they can come outside. And so um, if they can move from whatever location they're at in the room and come to an open area. And so we ask the patient to move out into that area. If the patient is critical or is unable to move, then um, the two providers would um, talk back to the other providers, make sure that they're getting fully suited up and, um, and, and respond in. So we are looking at um, adding responders, max of four ever in the room um, with a patient based on criticality. So um, our standard PPE on all calls right now is mask, which is the, the N95 gloves and eye protection, uh, that's standard. If we receive a positive screening or a positive doorway screen, um, we add at Sioux Falls Fire the Tyvek suits because that's what we had the most of. Um, the ambulance service is actually doing the BSI, um, BSI gowns. And so we, we add another layer. As we, if we have to enter the um, hot zone, like in a residence or, or business, we take in what's called the scout bag. Um, our scout bag um, is the first piece of equipment that goes into the patient. Um, and the first thing that we do is place a mask on the patient so that we limit um, that arrows, um, aerolizing effect um, of the patient talking to us, breathing on us, and those types of things. So every patient is given a mask as soon as we, we enter that environment. Um, in the bag, I can show you here, um, we have two surgical masks, so if one fails, a nasal cannula, um, a blood pressure cuff, a stethoscope, and a pen light. This is for basic first response um, with our patient. The other two responders, um, from the fire department um, are gonna stay in what's called the warm zone. They're gonna ready all of their equipment. So if we need a uh, cardiac monitor, any of our other equipment, um, they're gonna stage that um, out of that um, response area of that patient. And so um, they're gonna stage it, get ready. If they need to, um, they can uh, gown or uh, Tyvek suit up if needed. 
and um, they'll come in and respond. And so that's kind of what the scout program is. It allows us to um, not expose a lot of equipment, um, limit our providers and responders that are seeing those patients, and then um, get us to get that patient into an open air environment um, that is less susceptible for, for transmission. All right, so that's kind of just the summary of that. And I'm gonna turn this off here so we can talk a little bit more. Excuse me here. All right. Um, so um, that's kind of where we're at with the, the response here in Sioux Falls. Just a little bit about what's going on down here. Um, you know, the last thing you want for your community is someone to say, oh, you are the hot spot in the nation. Well, um, and that's where we're at. We have, as of today, um, we have, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, we have over a thousand specific um, COVID uh, patients that are associated with Smithfield. Um, it's almost 900 actual employees out of 3,700. And right now they're seeing a little over 200 um, families. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. We've seen at this point, we are still expecting a surge um, for the really sick patients. We've seen probably a small percentage of decrease in our EMS runs, but I can say um, with fact is that the types of patients that we're seeing are much sicker um, than our normal, normal response prior to this. Um, one of the questions that just came up um, is, do you have a better um, patient response with the nasal cannula versus a mask? Um, what we're looking at is um, the nasal cannula can go underneath that um, surgical mask that we've put on the patient. Uh, Chad kind of talked a little bit about those low pulse ox, um, and we're really trying to just get oxygen on these patients. Um, and if you think about putting, you know, six, four to six liters on a patient nasal cannula with the mask on, you know, you're getting probably a little bit higher concentration uh, than what you would normally get with a nasal cannula. Um, but also, um, we have, you know, there's just not a lot of good data out there to say one is better than the other. If those patients are in those really low pulse ox, yes, we're gonna definitely, um, that would be then an indication to us that we need um, additional equipment that's staged in that warm zone. And they would um, get us in, you know, non-rebreathers to get on that patient. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. You know, it's, it's what we know right now for best practice. Uh, I, it's amazing, um, you know, since this really started in the, in the state side, you know, in January, um, January, February timeframe, uh, you know, best practice is kind of uh, mostly word of mouth. And so we're, we're just trying to do, you know, the best patient care that we can and limit the risk of our providers. Amy, I had a question for you. Um, yeah. when, when you said that the EMS runs that you're running on now are, the patients are a lot sicker. Mm -hmm. um, do you, are you guys attributing some of that to Patients are waiting a lot longer to call 911 just because of the COVID uh, pa pandemic that's going on and they're staying at yep. home a lot longer? Yes. Um, you know, the South Dakota Health Department 
is uh, is doing a great job communicating from what I can understand with the individuals that are, are COVID positive. Um, they're also in touch with their personal um, physicians. And so they're trying to manage these patients at home um, to, to help with that surge at the hospitals. Um, and so they're really trying to, to lower the number of patients that you know, need to go into. Um, yeah, so I think you're seeing that and I think they finally, you know, we've had numerous just, you know, stories of people saying, well, I finally just had to call 911. I'm, I'm that sick. And, um, you know, I talked to my doctor and, and they finally said I should just go, go in. Um, I had a follow up to Amy. For yeah. Her. Um, yeah. So as much as you can say, I guess, have you guys been experienced, has Sioux Falls Fire or the police department been experiencing any um, sick workers or an elevated um, number of sick workers due to this? I mean, do you have anybody out right now that's... that's uh, you know, I can honestly COVID? say right now, I'm aware of no fire that are out sick. Um, I don't know for sure about police. I've just heard rumors that there's, there may be, you know, they've been exposed. Um, we, every, every morning uh, we take temperature um, and every uh, night, and then when they get off shift, we take temperature. So two to three times a day, um, we do take body temperatures and anyone that is experiencing any symptoms um, are um, then isolated and then um, are going home. Uh, another thing that really was uh, nice that our city actually did, um, and it was in the news yesterday, is that they did a contract with the University of Sioux Falls and opened up one of the dorms. Um, and so our providers that don't feel comfortable as we see an increase, and we are expecting to still see an increase in call volume um, here very soon, um, is that um, they can stay at the dorm at University of Sioux Falls. And so they we're able to um, limit the risk of spread to those family members. And so we've been been really excited about having that as an option. That's um, great. That's great. I, I think Aberdeen's doing that as well. At NSU, yeah, someone so just noted that, awesome. that Aberdeen NSU has dorms that are available for first responders. So that's great. Um, one another question about the mask. Um, the non rebreather, again, yeah, you still want to put a, that surgical mask over the top of the non rebreather uh, to, to limit exposure. Um, we just, we're doing the best we can with figuring out how to make sure that you limit that aerosol. Um, our medical board that governs um, our protocols has recommended uh, that we wait on innovations, if at all possible, if we are um, for the patient um, and not to innovate patients just based on um, just on pulse oximetry, that there has to be some other contributing factors. Uh, if at all possible, if we can uh, ventilate the patient with a bag valve mask and get them to the emergency room, uh, they would prefer that they could do the innovations um, right in the ER, in the negative pressure rooms, um, with the visualization laryngoscope so that they're even further away from the patient's face than we do with an actual uh, blade and, and handle. So that's kind of uh, some of the things that we've been talking about. So Amy, Kyle again here, just uh, a yeah. couple of other follow-ups. Um, so Chad mentioned that 30 to 40. Are you guys seeing that with any patients down there, those real low O2 sats? Um, we've seen patients between 60 and 70. 
Um, I have not heard of any in the 30s and 40s, but okay. um, that doesn't mean that it's not. But yeah, we've yeah. had some patients in the um, 60s and 70s, and you know, those were the patients that would get in, you know innovated right away, and um, yeah. they're just really asking us to assess the whole patient. Um, and there's a lot of of information coming out that the the longer that we can avoid or completely avoid um, putting a patient on a ventilator, the better outcome these patients have. Um, patients, and I think that's kind of what Chad was alluding to, once the patient gets on a ventilator, um, their morbidity rate is pretty high. And so um, if there's any way that we can um, maintain and, and get those patients to the hospital and see if they can try some extra um, treatments prior to innovation. Um, that's really what they'd like us like to see us do. Sure, sure. Are you guys seeing an uptick in, in cardiac arrest or anything like that, as, as he was alluding to? Is that something that you guys have seen? We, um, we've not, no, not here in Sioux Falls, but okay. this is what I can say. We are at the point, you know, we are about two weeks out from the big, the bigger outbreak of Smithfield. And so what we're, you know, um, there's a strong concern um, that we are gonna see an uptick um, very soon. You know, we're getting towards the end of April and where we're looking around that um, late April, middle May for a peak that's, that's been communicated out there. Um, these, um, especially, you know, like the Smithfield, since that was kind of a high concentration, um, the ones that are really sick, um, this would be about the time where, uh, you know, they, they may be turning the corner for the worst or, or recovering. Right, right. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. So, um, you know, we're seeing lots of hopes and prayers that, you know, maybe that, that won't happen here. Um, you know, again, you look at that population of Smithfield, they're going to be um, a little bit younger. So they're not in that high number that you were showing, like you were showing at earlier. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, we've also seen, you know, a couple outbreaks in um, our nursing homes or um, elderly care centers, you know, uh, both Good Sam's and um, All Saints have both seen kind of a higher number. Um, so we're watching those very closely. Uh, and kind of just any patient that we're going on there is, is really just a, a COVID positive in our book until, you know, as, as a responder. So we're taking full precautions at those places. Yeah. Um, how's the morale of your, of your, of your team down there, of your, of your firefighters? Are, are they hanging in there or are they getting kind of antsy as well? Um, they're doing good. Uh, great positive attitudes. Um, we're, you know, it, it's the unknown. Uh, of knowing, you know, when are we going to be coming out the other side? And that's nothing different than all of us and, and getting a little antsy. Um, they're really trying to find creative ways to do training um, and, uh, and social distance at the same time. Uh, the community in a, as a whole, um, I, I you know, I don't know how many of you have seen some of our newscasts with our mayor, um, but he's doing a phenomenal job of communicating to everybody in the city. Um, we have had the best support in getting supplies and materials. Um, it's really nice that a couple of the major players, uh, such as Stryker, and boundary, uh, the, the reps are within miles of our city. So we've had personal relationships with them and been able to get equipment. Um, 
the state has been fantastic about getting us uh, stocked up with all of the equipment that we need. You know, I just, if I can uh, reiterate anything that you said, Kyle, the thing that I would say is know what you have on hand um, and, and know what you have right now so that you can uh, make sure that you have enough PPE if you do end up with, you know, a, a hot spot in your community and, and you do end up running a bunch of calls so that you protect yourself and your, and your crew members. Great. Well, thank you very much, Amy. That was very much appreciated to get the insight from what you guys are dealing with down there. Does anybody else have any questions for Amy? You can either put them in the chat box or you can, or you can unmute and ask. Uh, looks like we got, got one that popped in. This is kind of for anybody, I think. Is anybody working on ramping up testing? Um, how are we going to figure out who is positive and, and asymptomatic in places like Sioux Falls with the very limited testing we seem to have available? Does any, Amy, do you have any insight on that at all? Um, both of Vera and Sanford um, are significantly increasing um, their testing. Um, interestingly enough, uh, yesterday I heard um, Avera is kind of the uh, provider of choice based on insurance for Smithfield. Um, but Sanford kind of uh, put out there that even if you are a Smithfield employee, um, they will provide the COVID test at their facility uh, free of charge. And so, um, you know, to try to keep increasing the um, the number of testing so that we know the extent. Uh, we know there is 900 or 1,000 positive um, just from the Smithfield incident. Um, that's known. So you're absolutely right. We don't know how many people are asymptomatic out there and potentially spreading the disease. Thank you very much for that. Anybody else have any questions for Amy while we have her on? <clears throat> well, Amy, we really appreciate you coming on and um, I hope to, to tab you again to maybe, to maybe help us as we're, as we're trying to educate ourselves and get information um, from folks who have been dealing with it. I mean, in our neck of the woods, we're, we're a little bit um, low on our numbers, I think, than what was initially projected. But I, I do think that we're going to see some spikes as well. I know the Demcota beef plant, according to the Department of Health, has nine cases out there. And I did just hear today that they are cutting back on some, some of their production to try to help with that social distancing. So hopefully they've been able to get information from obviously your city, Smithfield, Department of Health to, to help with some of that um, spread up here, so. You know, Kyle, the other thing then that I would say too um, is we deal with these situations is I have, and I know a number of people that I work with have started, um, it would have been nice to know or man, let's hope, let's, if we have to deal with this again, kind of lists um, and, and mark those down. You know, right now, uh, like I told somebody yesterday, um, I've been in survival mode for about four to six weeks um, at my job, just making sure things are done. Um, but we keep saying, oh gosh, I wish we would have done this or known that. Um, we're gonna remember that is if we write it down. So if I can leave you with that is in your system, um, start a list so that you kind of can prepare after this kind of this first um, wave is through. Um, one question that popped in is, is there, are the Sioux Falls hospitals charging for the test? Do you know, do you know that at all, Amy? No, you know what? I don't. Um, like I said, I just know that that came out and that was in the news yesterday 
um, that Sanford wasn't charging. I, I don't. I apologize. I'm not sure if they no, are. No, no problem. No problem. I think if you probably go to the, the DOH website, you can get some more information on that. Um, or even those websites of those, of those facilities probably have some information on that. Do we have any other questions? Any, any comments? Uh, Amy, um, are you yes. finding a problem with language barrier at all? You know, um, that was not a surprise when that came in out, came out in the CD with the C report. That's been an issue for us for a really long time in our community. Um, uh, we have just in the school district, I think there was 137 dialects spoken in the school. Um, and that has been a concern of the fire department for a very long time is communicating with um, our non-English speaking population in our city uh, because it's so diverse. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is not a surprise to us. Um, and we've been working on that um, for a while. It's a really hard thing to, um, to tackle though. And so we're just trying to reach out to our, um, the cultural, different cultural groups, leaderships in, the, in our city to find out who can help us communicate with those groups. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a, a big issue with, with that group. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Anything else? Does anybody have anything else? Uh, Sandra, are you on? Michaela, do you guys have anything at all this week? No, but um, Amy, Sandy, Derek, and I know you from years past. Thanks. Your presentation was fabulous. And um, I just learned a ton. And it's so neat to hear people who can bring it home, I guess is what I would say. And um, thank you to the guys out in New York for um, being willing to get on and talk to all of us this evening. So that's it for me. All right, Michaela, do you have anything tonight? Nope, other than thank you once again to all of our wonderful speakers we had tonight. Michaela, could you talk um, could you talk about the the website, the AHEC website where the archive is at? Could you talk about where that's located? Yeah, I can pull up my screen and show you guys. While Michaela's doing that, I'm going to answer a question um, that just came through. As far as insight as to what Aberdeen is seeing, I did visit with Keith yesterday a little bit to get some of his thoughts. And um, I know Patty Woods is on the phone as well, or on the call as well. So if she has anything to add, I would, we'd appreciate that as well. Um, as far as call numbers going up um, with the, the, the DIMCO to cluster, as Keith called it, um, he said they haven't really seen an uptick in in calls they are still going um with all the precautions that that he spoke about last week and they're still proceeding that way um as far as the city itself i do know there was a press release that was put out i think on monday or tuesday of the off-site bed potential that is going to be needed when our area up here spikes so I don't know, Patty, do you have anything on that to add or, or just go to the, the press release? Did you want to add anything on that at all? Um, yeah, we just, that's basically what our job is right now is we're just continually working on getting that surge facility available if it is needed. Um, just making sure that, you know, both hospitals are contributing to the supply list that would be needed in that uh, location. Um, making sure we have like a generator available, oxygen, things like that. Um, the, the biggest thing is I think that we would not put COVID patients in that surge center. That would probably be more like a step down unit before people go home. But depending on our surge, that's kind of our plan. That's basically been all, all of our focus lately is just making sure that we're up to par on that. 
just making sure that all our T's are crossed and I's are dotted kind of thing. So that's basically as far as the EOC goes, we're just all communicating by email and, and uh, phone right now. We're not all in the same facility um, like we were at the very beginning. Um, but um, still making ha some hand sanitizer for some of the first responders in the area, making sure everybody has masks, those kind of things. So that's basically about all we are doing right now in the EOC part of it and the search part. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, I did have a comment come through as far as every ambulance goes. Uh, they, they have run about the same call volume. They haven't seen an uptick with anything. Uh, Michaela, are you ready to talk about that website or share your screen? And then we're going to get to Representative yep. Perry. Okay. Yeah, here it is. So it, this is a normal or the AHEC page website. If you click over on events, it will show down here, I'll show the community panel. And then it gives information on that of the next one that we'll have. But then on the main page right here, once it clicks back to that, sorry. Um, this will turn to the this page and you'll click that. And it will give you the folder and this master folder will have the full, like every, every webinar has its own folder, which I'll put any supplemental documents, any chat, the chat that go along with it, and then the video and the audio as well. We'll go to the drive. Sorry for the loading. And while that's loading, you usually have those up by like Monday or Tuesday, right? The, sometimes it takes a yeah. long time for those to convert over, right? Yep, yep. I tried, I'm tried. i trying to get them up by Monday, but to, no later than Tuesday on that. Okay. And then that master link will show, and then each of these have their, each folder will have <laughs> anything that goes along with the, Go, went, that went along with the webinar for that week. And, and if I still have Amy on, Amy, are, are you okay with us putting those slides up on there? Is that, is that okay if we do that? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, <laughs> just so I covered my basis, um, I asked our uh, chief officers if I could share them, and they said, absolutely. Okay. Um, so use it. Great. Yeah. And if anybody that. needs the slides, um, and I don't, Kyle, the other thing I was going to say, we did redo our video um, on pit crew CPR, how we manage cardiac arrests in the city of Sioux Falls. It just came out today. Okay. Um, I have a YouTube link uh, that we just, we just put together. So if anybody wants that, uh, let me know and I'd be happy to share it. Um, if, if you would be so kind to maybe share it in the chat portion, because then um, after oh, Michaela okay. gets this put up, then you can go into that chat portion and, and find that link. That's great. Thank you. Okay, Michaela, sorry. Or, or do you have it? Are you good? Oh, that, that was everything. If that makes it easier for people to get to it. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I usually send the email out Monday or Tuesday uh, from my email list. And I know I'm still missing some people. Um, I apologize. I'm still trying to, to take those email lists and combine them all into one. Um, it's getting relatively long and that's what we like to see. So if, if I do not have your email, you go ahead and put that in the chat link. Um, if you're not getting the email sent to you and you would like it sent to you. And what that email usually says is what we have available for hours for this week, for this week. And then also what we, uh, what time and everything we're going. I think the seven o'clock start time is kind of where we're going to stay. Um, so just plan for that set 7 p.m. And we're going to probably run these for about an hour, hour and a half, hour 15, somewhere in there. And um, then we'll let you get on with your evening. But one more uh, individual that would like to share, share a few comments is one of our state representatives, uh, Carl Perry. So Carl, if you want to 
Take it away. Go ahead. Kyle, we can again. Carl, you're going to have to unmute. Sorry about that. Nope, there we got you. I am so sorry. What I told you was a compliment for Michaela and for Sandra. Those are people with uh, AHEC that are really super. And uh, Kyle, I really appreciate the chance to say a couple words. Primarily, what I'm just going to do is say that our Secretary of Health, Ken Malsom uh, Rison, and uh, our uh, Governor, Christy Noem, she's been really a keen ambassador for this COVID situation. And we've been having press conferences with media, with mayors, with counties, with healthcare, with legislators, and uh, with several different areas. And it is to reduce fears and increase communications. And we've had a lot of unemployment in South Dakota. It's increased dramatically. And, you know, we talk about the problems New York has. We have problems here. They're not quite as uh, amplified as New York, but we do have problems. March 16th, we had 1,700 total unemployment claims for the week. The following week, March 23rd, we had 8,000. We've been running 8,000 ever since. But I have a couple uh, websites that I'll give you because I think they're important. COVID.sd.gov. And that on that particular website, it gives you the number of tests, the number of people that are positive, recovered, uh, the ones that are negative, the ones that are pending, the ones that are uh, deceased, and, and it has all that information, the numbers that are still hospitalized or ever been hospitalized. And if somebody wants to volunteer to help, we have a volunteer.southdakota.gov line so people can help. And if you have anybody that's under stress with their South Dakota taxes, the state taxes, the Department of Revenue is ready to help out as much as they can. And they're at DOR at SD.gov. And uh, their number is 800-829-9188. And uh, the COVID number is 800-997-2880. And that includes asking them for things like medical supplies, masks, wipes, gloves, or anything else that a person can think of. And our governor, yeah, I really am proud of our governor. She's done some really good things. But, you know, we're dealing with community spread, uh, social distancing, washing our hands, a mask, trying to be open for business, uh, sustaining state governments, sustaining our local governments, sustaining our local towns, and mental health of our people. But um, my role in government is uh, I'm a District 3 representative, which means I'm up in Aberdeen, Brown County. And I'm available to help where I can. And I work with the Health and Human Services Task Force or Committee. Uh, and I also work with the Commerce and Industry Committee and Energy Committee. And I also work with retirement laws. And so we work with a lot of different areas. But uh, on one of Christie's or Governor Gnome's recent talks, she said we have three things that we can be thankful for in South Dakota. And that's that we have faith hope and love and the greatest of these is love. And she says, you can know for sure that we're gonna get through this. And my final comment, I've been uh, given a couple talks for a couple different groups, but my final comment is we need to just step up and do some random act of kindness for people. Uh, you know, uh, own somebody, say hello, send a note, uh, tell somebody thank you. You know, exercise some social distance, but be sure to exercise. And the biggest exercise that we can do that takes the least amount of uh, muscles is smile because people would like to see you smiling. And that's all I have for you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carl. Appreciate that. Um, appreciate you doing what you're doing um, for the groups that you work with. Um, so with that, I think we're going to probably call it an evening unless somebody else had anything. Um, if... Kyle, I have something that I don't know if this is really the time to bring it up. Maybe a future session would be better, but I've been listening to some debate and a little research on the flu virus shot vaccination versus COVID-19. And there are two sides, of course. One says we shouldn't be, 
Another says we are. Does anybody know or any research out there as far as how many of these patients or even people that just show positive have had the flu shot versus those that did not have the flu shot? Do and, we have any? Do we have anybody on that's got any insight into that? And and if not, you know, Terry, that's something that that we can look into for next week and uh, potentially find somebody that could that could talk to us about that. Does anybody have any insight into that at all this evening? That would be where you would call the South Dakota Department of Health and talk to uh, the people that work with uh, Kim Malsum Rice, and and uh, they would they would be the ones that would have that information okay. or find that information. Uh, of course, Severa could give you information and Sanford could give you information and Monument Health could give you information. But uh, I think the state could probably get that information put together quicker. And that was really a, a, an interesting question. And I'm sorry, it was. but uh, it was something that I thought I could add. Yeah, I appreciate that, Carl. Uh, yeah, Terry, I think that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll try to get somebody on next week from the Department of Health that can maybe you know, answer some of those questions. Um, so that's, that's a good, that's a good thing that, that maybe we can at least get some insight into that potentially. Um, the other thing that I'm going to say before we do call it a night is um, you guys still want to continue to have these weekly. Is that still the consensus? I see we had over 60 people on again tonight, which is a great number. So if you do want to continue to have these weekly, just go ahead and drop a yes in the chat box. So we know that we're still, getting good information out. Um, and, and I have to again, thank AHEC, uh, Sandra Durek and Michaela Titus for bringing this to us to, to partner with them to get information out to EMTs from across the state. And we can't thank them enough for, for being such a great partner in that. So we, we really appreciate them and everything they've done for us. So I think with that, um, we are going to call it a night. We will be meeting again next Friday at 7 p.m. And we'll probably go until about 8.30. We'll try to get some speakers. The thing that I need your guys' help with is we need some, some people to chime in on what you guys want to know about this. Because we're trying to get... We're trying to get a, a diverse broad of, or a, a broad group of speakers to answer any questions that you guys may have. So if there's certain things out there, and I appreciated that question from uh, Terry out in, in Eureka, and we will, we will reach out to the Department of Health and see if we can't get someone, get someone on uh, for, for next week's call. And so that's a good, a good start. And if anybody else has anything, that they would specifically like to know about or hear about, or maybe um, somebody that we've had on in the past that you would like to, to, to hear again. So. Kyle, this is Melinda and Groton. Yes, I guess I'm just kind of curious as uh, from the hospital point of view is actually what kind of treatments are they doing in the hospital and especially before intubation? Are they using any antibiotics? Is it oxygen therapy? What, what are they doing once you're admitted to the hospital? Okay, that sounds good. We will, we will, we will use that. And I'm betting Michaela's writing this stuff down if I know her. Um, and then I also had a, a person drop in there to see if we can find somebody who has recovered to talk to us. And I think I might have the right person in mind. We will see if we can't reach out to that person and see if they will, they will talk to us. All right. So with that, I think we will, we will sign off for the evening. If there's anything else after we, after we cut the chat off, uh, go ahead and email me um, or send me a text. Uh, probably email me uh, would be the best way to do it so I can go through them and keep better track of what, what we're getting. Um, so just send me an email. It's kmoser, M-O-S-E-R, E-M-T, zero four at outlook.com and again my phone number for anybody who needs me to log their hours for them is 605-216-6794 yes i will put my email in the chat i will do it before we sign off 
but I am going to mute right now, and that will be that will be the evening. So, Michaela, if you can keep it up for just a couple of seconds here yet, um, that'll be all we have for this evening. I appreciate Amy taking time out of her schedule to visit with us. It's very much appreciated. And also Chad and Zach out in New York for, for visiting with us. So thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Have a good weekend. Michaela, I think that should probably do it. Sounds good. Have a good night. You too. Thanks.